And welcome back to a fresh episode of the Business Growth Show. I'm delighted to be joined by Mia Butler today. Mia is the founder and director over at Pistachio View, and she believes that vanilla is not an option. She's transforming the way we sell and communicate using video email to help you win more customers and get faster replies. Mia, a very warm welcome to the show. How's it going? Hi, really good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No worries. So looking forward to this one. It's um, it's going to be a, a great topic because I'm sure a lot of business owners, especially tuning in, may find sales boring. They may, may found it rude. It may be something they really just hate doing, but they know it's part of the process that they need to do to keep clients coming and keep the cash in the bank, keep the revenue flowing. Uh, so we're going to be chatting through oh, why it doesn't sales doesn't need to be boring and how we can interrupt our, our ideal customers without without being frustrating, without pissing them off, basically. Um, so, so let's jump straight into it, Mia. I'd love to know your thoughts on, on why sales doesn't need to be boring as a starting point. Do you know what? I think the simple answer for this is it all comes down to mindset. Um, with sales, a lot of people have been conditioned that it's like this hard push, you're pushing out and interrupting people's days, that you're annoying, you're forcing all the things on them that they might not have thought about. Whereas if you transfer your mindset to just about helping people, then I think that's where you have a more positive love affair with the sales and the sales function um, and it's easy to fall out of love of it with it if you're just doing the same old things over and over again so you have to remember that it's about helping people we all like helping people right yeah yeah, yeah and that makes sense I mean that's that's certainly something we've touched on the show before kind of focus on on helping rather than focusing on the end result which might be the sale um which can of course brush off if you're talking to customers if you're talking to prospects the chances are when you lay it on thick and you're just pushing for the deal that they're, they're probably going to sense something's up and probably not want to do business with you right right for sure for sure there's i think that time where we uh, all learned about features and benefits is now long gone um so if i think back to my kind of grassroots sales training um, I was working for a holiday company. So I was just about to head overseas as a holiday rep. Um, and I bet lots of other salespeople have been through this as well. And I spent a week in a hotel being conditioned by the travel company on how to sell because that tourism income, the sales, once they were on site in resort, was massively important to them. And you know what? It was massively important to me too. That was my drinking money, right? I needed it. But that whole sales training was about features and benefits and that you know so what so what why is that important and and I kind of feel like I've I've left that side of me behind not only that carefree vodka drinking girl but <laughs> this person that you know really hangs on to features and benefits it's rare that I get to having a feature and benefit conversation until, you know, way, way down the line when we're almost, you know, at the finishing line, because now it's all about the other person. It's not about me anymore. I don't know how comfortable I am with that, but it's not. It's not about me. Yeah, no, I like that. And um, I, I can certainly relate. It's definitely in my younger days, back when I was 18, 19, going back a bit now, as I've, I've just recently turned 30. But um <laughs> feels like a year it feels like a flipping lifetime ago I was in the pub as well on that note but I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole or, nice. otherwise I'll probably get depressed um <laughs> but anyway mo moving forward I mean you mentioned some good points in terms of not not focusing on features and benefits and even back to the topic itself I mean a lot of business owners I'm sure finding that the idea the prospect of selling to people perhaps frustrating perhaps antagonizing perhaps it's something they leave to last they want to focus on all the other angles of their business until it actually comes to talking to customers um, and getting the getting that business in so how I don't want to focus the show too much on mindset but how do we get it in our minds Mia that, that we're not actually selling to people our our services our products are actually of value and we're helping them out by offering them our wares yeah. I mean, well, the short answer for that is that if you don't have sales and some sort of pipeline, then your your business is going to come to a grinding halt anyway. So I think, you know, connecting yourself with that purpose is pretty important. Mm. But, uh, you know, the more comfortable you get with understanding your customers, it actually then gets quite exciting. You know, we, we like engaging with people and never more so now that we're in this changed world 
we've become you know removed from the workplace we're all working from home so actually the engagement is, has got a lot more exciting and um, so it's not only a positive part of my day reaching out to customers and talking to them but I'm finding I'm a positive part of their day so it's like a really prime time to you know either re-engage or start engaging with new customers it's exciting to talk to people who'd have thought that's a novelty yeah yeah especially the fact i guess in the uk most of us are stuck at stuck between four walls stuck in our house wherever we're living yeah and the fact that it can break up the day especially if you're speaking to someone that's kind of exciting that's offering offering something of use to you then that, that's a really good way to look at it that you're actually yeah. not not just for your own point of view but from from the people that you're talking to that you're adding value to their day so i like yeah. that Okay, well, jumping into to the topic in terms of how we can actually interrupt our busy prospects without frustrating them, without being annoying, is is there a process that you like to follow, Mia, that you can you can teach us, or something, or a way, a strategy you've got in mind that's that's really really worked for yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think what we have to work out is firstly who our ideal customer is, and I think we've talked about this a lot as a whole um, across the sales industry right now. But the, the crux of it is, if you don't know what your ICP looks like and the kind of challenges that they are up against at the moment, so that you know how to walk in their shoes then actually you're not going to bring enough value to the table anyway in whatever level you're doing. Um, but the way that I like to follow in my process of connecting with prospects is, is pretty much trying to use a lot of different parts in my selling toolkit. Um, I definitely think you can't be a one-trick pony. Um, so if you love email, then you can't just sit in email. Um, if you are an advocate of picking up the phone, then Yep, that's great, but you can't just rely on picking up the phone. So I think you've got to bring a little bit of everything to the table. Um, I definitely start off my process with social selling. And why wouldn't I? You know, LinkedIn is the place to be. Um, there's no question about that is still a great business platform. And, you know, there's nothing coming up behind it competing with it yet. So that direct access to people is, is essential. Um, but it's about connecting with them on value on that first level. So I, I spend most of my time not actually thinking about my content strategy for LinkedIn, um, but more about my engagement strategy, because that's where I feel I bring the most value to meeting and connecting with new people. Um, and most people connect with me after they've read a comment or something I've shared on somebody else's post. And I think that's really interesting that everybody gets really hung up on you know what they post and what they should be great time quality engagement you're making people feel good again and it all comes down to that that people feeling validated mm. that you've brought something valuable to the table so I definitely start out with social selling um and I'm sure you do too right most of us yeah do. I mean I I'm, I'm certainly on LinkedIn more time than I care to admit um as, yeah. I, as I mentioned on this show and in fact people have introduced tools that can can get me off LinkedIn <laughs> <laughs> it's probably something for, something I need to snap up, but definitely, like you say, I mean, those points all make sense. So to break that down a little bit, so we're talking about connecting with value, having some kind of engagement strategy based upon where your idle customers are on. Um, and the, the interesting part about LinkedIn, not just focusing on content, but focusing on actually engagement, um, engaging on posts, which we can get to in a sec. But you mentioned connecting on value connecting with value, sorry, and also utilizing all the tools in your toolkit, which I love. But could you dive a bit deeper, me into to what that actually means? As in, does that mean we need to send someone an email straight away, then send them a video, then we need to give them a voice message, then we need to call them to check they've got email? Or what does that actually look like? And what does connecting with value mean? Yeah, of course. So I guess this is always going to be different for the type of customer and profile you're working with. But I tend to find that, you know, my first few engagements are on LinkedIn. So by the time we've got a bit of dialogue going, uh, they've recognized that I'm showing up in their feed and bringing value to it by adding something valuable to what they're saying or asking questions about what they are talking about that's important to them right now. Um, and then my goal is to, you know, try and connect with them with a direct message. Um, and I do love a pattern interrupt at this point. Um, so I'm a huge fan of not only video email, which is, you know, my business remit, but I use video DMs a lot too. Okay. Um, 
And the reason I like both, you know, both methods, but let's stick with the direct messages at the moment, is that it people have to click play. So it's not like a short piece of text that you can ignore. Um, I, I like the fact that I approach it with a really bright and breezy attitude as well. So it's it's always unapologetically, authentically me. Um, I wish there was a better word for authentically. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's just me. And, you know, I send a DM that is, you know, hey, this is me. I notice so something of value I notice about them and see if I can push it to a question. The types of things I avoid are, you know, dropping my calendar link or, you know, pushing them to a meeting or anything like that first. That comes later. I've got to earn that. Um, and I think that's also something really important to, you know, remember that you've got to earn these people's time. You know, I've had yep. I've had at least five emails today from people saying, here's my calendar link. You know, why would I do that without us even having some sort of discovery call before we, you know, I just drop in your random calendar? I just wouldn't do it. Would you? I do wonder how many people get replies when they just stick in the the old two, three paragraphs, whether it's an email, whether it's a LinkedIn message, whatever right. form of communication it is, where you're just reading through this wall of text and then there's a calendar link. It's like, how many people actually click that Stop. and book a time? It's, yeah. it's, it is mad. Okay. Well, I love that video message breakdown. So we've got kind of a, a nice, personal, authentic int intro. Um, we've got a part about you're mentioning that you've seen something on their profile. So does that have to be something specific, Mia? Does it have to be related to what we do or our service? Or Yeah, okay. So one of the things that I don't like seeing is when people reach out on a connection based on something that they've just spotted on my profile. So kind of like, I don't know, if I said I enjoy drinking water and that's on my profile, <laughs> then, you know, that isn't enough for us to have common ground and want me to book into your calendar. Um, and I feel that's the same for my customer, you know, so I can't, you know, just say, Oh, I know I noticed you like skiing. Yeah, me too. That's great that we have similar likes and interests. But what we need to do for our customers right now who are time poor, you know, working with incredible amounts of workload, having a lot of data and intelligence coming with them, is come to them with something that's going to make them be better off by the end of speaking to us. Sure. Um, and so that means we've got to know a bit about what's going on in their world right now and if we and we we place that at the start by saying you know are you struggling to get your emails open because of the working from home situation right now you know it's so frustrating just getting those no replies and being ghosted and they're going yeah that that is exactly what's happening to me right now i can't bear it um, so just having them nod with you at the first instance is really important but it it can't be how it used to be by just saying i noticed on your profile it's just not enough go deep like it okay and then just raising raising a question at the end you mentioned again does that have to be something that's that's relevant that's really we've got to spend two five ten minutes researching their profile or looking up their website or is it, is it going to be simpler than that yeah, I, you know, a, a call to action for me um, is is just a way to move the conversation forward. My ideal scenario with LinkedIn DMs is that I don't want to keep them on there. I eventually want to move them out and talk to them somewhere else, be that sure. on a phone call, be on an email, uh, virtual meeting, whatever they want to do. I don't want to stay in DMs with them. But for my rules for CTA, it's just one. Just put one call to action at the end yep. uh, and the way to move the conversation forward. Um, and I definitely like to play with humor. Um, that works for me. You know, I'm not saying it can work for everybody. But I, I, I kind of like, you know, this light and breezy approach with things. And sometimes just simply closing by saying, does that sound like something that, you know, you can see round right now um, is enough? You know, you don't always have to be some sort of, you know, sales geek level 10. You can just, you know, be honest because that trust and value, if they can feel it, sense it, then that's the way that people are going to feel comfortable to do that CTA. Yeah, it's a nice little framework, really. It doesn't sound like you need to overthink it. You just need to kind of get on yeah. with it. And 
put I that feel like I in place. say that a lot, you know, don't overthink it, particularly with the, the people I work with in video email, because that realm of uncomfortableness, as soon as you start using video, is just like off the scale. Uh, people, as soon as they switch that camera on, feel massively uncomfortable. And of course they would. It's super weird. You know, you're looking at yourself, you're hearing your voice, you're noticing all these things about yourself that you've never noticed before. And then you start procrastinating and wasting time because you're overthinking things. And, and, and that's really one of the biggest time drains for sales professionals and business owners because they're overthinking something that doesn't need to be that complicated. Sometimes just, you know, shoot from the hip, go for it. What's the worst that can happen? You get a no. No, that's not even a bad thing. You can learn from that. You get a no reply. You keep trying. Just detached and over, stop the overthinking really helps. Yeah, yeah, great tip. Okay, so that's that's video messaging, which is definitely effective. And like I've said on the show many, many times, I can't remember the last time I got a video message from LinkedIn or even via email. I mean, I send enough myself, especially on email. Wow. Um, but I can't remember the last time I had a video message. I can't even, well, I had the last um, audio note I had, I think was from you, Mia, but before that, <laughs> probably weeks ago, apart from the ones I send to my friends on WhatsApp, that was... I know, I know. And, and you see, that's the great thing, isn't it? So, and I get those replies every every day, every week from somebody going, oh, wow, I've never yeah. had that before to both, both video messages and voice notes. You know, how do I do that? And I think, crikey, where have you been? But unless you know, then you, you, why would you start using it? So there is still so few people using that. And we all spend a lot of time searching for our USP. Uh, and perhaps you don't need to think about what your USP is anymore. Perhaps that's gone. Perhaps it's just, you know, what differentiates you. Um, and I think that's one of the been part of the evolvement of sales is not only understanding how you can communicate differently, but also how your personal branding brings something to the table now. You know, you, you, it's, not, it's not cool to look commoditized. It's not, you know, it's not great to look corporate. It's not, uh, you know, engaging to sound robotic. The fact that we've had this moment to sort of peek into people's lives and see the most crazy things in people's backgrounds at home has opened up this whole new vulnerability that, yeah, most of us quite like, you know, that that real to real human to human conversation is is way more, way more fun, way more engaging, easier. Oh, I can't hear you, Sam. Oh, my mic was muted. I, what I was saying, sorry, if you want to pitch me, I'd be much more open to a video or audio message than um, just a generic text one, that's for sure, just because they're, they're so few and far apart. But moving yeah. the conversation on, I know you mentioned before, Mia, you should utilize all the tools in your toolbox. And I know before we hit record, you said we shouldn't just think about communicating to our ideal customers, our prospects on the channels we like. So mm. some people tuning into this might think, I absolutely love video. I've got no issue with video, mm -hmm. but I hate using the phone. Can't be bothered to type an email. Um, can't be bothered to, to do a message or whatever channel they may love. But at the end of the day, we've got to consider what our ideal customers like. So how do we utilize this approach? Um, so say, for example, we've not been able to connect with our target customer on LinkedIn. How can we utilize other channels to, at the same time, not be annoying, but still kind of add this value approach that we've been discussing and get the meeting or get the next step that, we were, that we're going for with them? Yeah, the, the principle is the same, whatever part of your toolkit you use. So if you are prospecting and reaching out for the first time um, and you haven't got it through social selling and a DM, so you're probably going to sit with an email or the telephone. You're going to pick up the phone. Oh, I sounded so posh, telephone. <laughs> uh, you're going to pick up the phone. Um, so whichever one of those you choose for, the principle still stays the same in the fact that I believe that on that initial introduction, you've got to demonstrate to that customer that you know them so that you've got something valuable and worthwhile taking some time away from their busy schedules yep. and that, that on that first point of contact it is not about selling anything it's about introducing and making them aware just that is the word, isn't it? Making them aware of you and the solution that you have that could possibly help them and moving it on to another call or conversation or, you know, whatever part of the toolkit's 
right for them uh, to then get the conversation going. So, you know, back to overthinking, that first call is, is not a big deal. As long as you are not, you know, launching yourself at them and dumping stuff all over them and just, you know, saying what you know so that they can see that you understand what they're going through so that you can move on to another stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. And I like the the point you made that you're you're essentially making them aware of who you are, what you c- might be able to do for them or might be able to possibly do for them and understanding that not every outreach is is going to be a great fit, that not everyone you speak to ever is is going to be um, a potential deal for you. So that's, that's yeah. some really sound advice. And once we get a response on that channel, should we always, do you think, do you recommend we always stick to the same channel we get a response in? I, if we get a response on email, do we stick to that? If someone replies to our LinkedIn message, do we keep it to that? Or should we be trying to move them straight on the phone as soon as we possibly can? Um, well, yeah, I think, I think, you know, phone is king. Getting a conversation is always going to be better than swapping voice notes or video messages mm. or emails having dialogue is the the objective that's what you want to get it to to have a dialogue with this person because that's when you get that nice 50 50 flow you you talk and listen ask questions and respond and uh, that that's the goal isn't it you know having a great conversation with somebody so so no you don't stick to the channel uh, but you mirror that customer's sort of energy in a way um, but guide them, you know, there's there's nothing worse than that sort of wishy-washy call to action that's like, you know, well, perhaps let's have a call next week if you're free or, you know, should we book a Zoom call or, you know, do, do you fancy uh, sending me your mobile and we'll WhatsApp, you know, help people, help them make a decision. And you can do that, you know, by kind of, you know, directing them in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Being being clear on your offering and, and giving yeah. them that that clear clear action for the next step. So, before we got into this, you you mentioned you've got a bit of an engagement strategy when it comes to LinkedIn, Mia. And I think if I remember right, you also said you tend to get a lot more connections from rather than just the content, the posts you put out, the comments you leave on other people's posts, which is quite interesting. So, I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about what you find an effective strategy because that's not something we've covered that much on the show and what's what works for you what you recommend people do there yeah I I think it's really important that you know the one thing if you're going to commit to being a part of the community on LinkedIn is you know looking to to engage on people's content and posts Um, and I honestly have a lot more fun doing that it's networking at that point you know that's like you know being back at a great breakfast meeting or something where you're you know chatting and talking um and that's where you learn a lot too you know that's when your ear is to the ground and you can hear what the community think about a different subject so i i always dedicate time during the day whether it's you know 15 block in the morning you know with my morning coffee and then another 15 minute block in the evening but i definitely look to make time every day to engage if i fail to post I can cope with that. You know, I know other people would, you know, have a bit of a panic attack about that if they're committed to that strategy. But as long as I am putting, you know, the right kind of value out there, then I think that helps with notoriety. And, you know, I'm not a LinkedIn influencer or anything like that. But what I do know is it's working for my business. Um, And that's what you've got to think about, not comparing yourself to what you see other people are doing in terms of, you know, what likes and responses and that they're getting. It's evaluate what's happening to you. And I am happy that 80% of my leads and referrals are coming in through LinkedIn. Even my referrals, you know, from somebody I am in direct contact with on a mobile phone, on email, um, you know, on our landlines, we a customer of mine will then DM me through LinkedIn to say, hey, this person wants to talk to you. Um, and if that's how my my customers want to be, then, yeah, I'm mirroring that. I'm replicating it. So it Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hugely powerful. It's something, uh, probably the main thing on LinkedIn that I'm guilty of not doing. So I'll, I'll spend all this time putting together content in terms of the actual posts or the videos that I'm putting out. But then I'll do that. I waste all my time in the morning doing that. Then I have to get on with my day and then just leave out the time to actually engage on posts, which like yeah. you say, sometimes can be more effective by the sounds of it. 
Well, and you know what? I think I find it quite liberating as well. From posting content, um, sometimes that, that that becomes quite quite pressured. You know, for me, I feel I feel the weight of it at times, thinking. I just don't know what to say today or that post bombed yesterday. So is it worth it? It can make you feel, you know, those emotional things. Whereas, you know, just commenting here and there, you know, is really just, you know, really liberating for me. And I, I don't feel the pressure and I don't feel the burden. And I feel those nice things again that I'm adding something to that person because I love it when somebody comments on mine so I'm pretty sure that they feel the same way um so I think you know sometimes don't overthink the content arch of it it's important I'm not pushing it to one side but if you just want to you know grow your contacts and be visible without that pressure then yeah, yeah it's worth worth putting time and effort in there definitely and on that note should we should we think about when we when we commenting on posts in the feed? Let's say it is LinkedIn. Should we think about if we can actually add value, or should we keep stick to stuff that's within our sector where we can actually talk about our own experience? Or does it matter? Is it just a case of something that resonates with us? We can comment on we're showing in the feed. Other people might see us and check out our profile. Is that the approach? Yeah, I I, d I think what there is to avoid is just going in with that. I loved it. Um, you know that vanilla answer doesn't you know, do enough um, and can look like, you know, you're part of a population that you don't want to look like a part of. So, you know, it, I think you can have personality. I think you can have humor. Uh, you can ask questions, you know, do what's right for you. If, if that's what your vibe is and how you talk to people, um, then, you know, put, put what you think. People have put their posts up there for a reason. Talk about it. Talk yeah. about it. Love that. And just to wrap things up, Mia, before we hit record, you, you mentioned, which I really like, that people want to, buyers want to engage and deal with experts. Yeah. So in everything that we've covered in the episode so far, in our outreaches, when we're connecting with people we want to have conversations with, we're trying not to annoy them, we, we want to give them value and, and generating those meetings, those demos, whatever our next step is. How can we portray that we are actually an expert we are professional. We know what we're talking about. We're not just an idiot that's trying to flog them anything from we've just found from down the street. Oh, wow. That's a big question. Huge question, um, I know. <laughs> really, really huge. The, the way you demonstrate your expertise is putting time and effort into grafting to learn those facts. Um, so, you know, you shouldn't be sending a message or picking up the phone or doing anything with a template that you've, you've used before without doing your research. So, you know, if you want the perfect lifestyle, you've got a time block in your diary to do research and understand the people that you are prospecting and want to connect with. Um, and by doing that research, then that's how you come to the table with expertise. Um, and if, you, if you're if you not sure what that is, you know, I always recommend, you know, phone your top 10 customers at the moment um, and ask them three, four really good questions about why they're working with you. And whenever they give you an answer, um, ask them a bit more on that. So if they said, you know, I'm working with you because you are really hilarious. I mean, that happens often. Um, <laughs> But, you know, well, what is it about me that's really funny? Well, it's uh, the fact that you think you're funny, but you're not. Uh, OK, so you say I'm not funny, but, you know, so just drilling down on that gives you all the insight and all the content you need to have great conversations. So even if you don't know where to start, start with the people that are already your advocates in your fan club and, you know, going to them and saying, can you help me? Rarely people say no to that little plea. Um, so find out why you did a great job for them, why it made a difference. And that's how you lead with the expertise on those first few sentences and conversations with that person. Great they way to wrap it up. They give yeah, you yeah, exactly. Exactly. Something something we talk about when we're, when we're dealing with websites, marketing strategies. If mm. you don't know what to put on your site, 
don't just go off what you think looks good. And this could be applied to any type of content, marketing, yeah. whatever you're doing, sales outreach. Talk to your customers because they'll tell you exactly why they chose to work with you, why they bought from you, what their problem was, how you help them resolve it, how yeah. you're helping them ongoing. And use that as the content, whether it's on your website, whether it's on your marketing, your sales outreach. That is the information you need to be sharing, not just whatever comes into your mind. That's that's the goal that can really help other people with similar problems work with and, and position you as a, a trusted advisor. Really solid advice, Mia. And with that, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, hey, my pleasure. Please do tell us a bit more about how people can learn from you, how people can connect with you, and the best way to get in touch. Yeah, sure. So no surprises. Uh, you can find my profile on LinkedIn, which is Mia Butler. Um, and I would love um, you to pattern interrupt my day. So connect and DM me. No problem. Excellent stuff, Mia. Thanks very much for, for coming on. We'll, we'll put a link to, to everything, your, your LinkedIn, your business and such in the show notes over at businessgrowth.marketing. And thanks once again. Really appreciate it. Hey, no worries. Thanks so much. Cheers. And if you enjoy the show, be sure to hit subscribe to Business Growth Show wherever the heck you get your podcast from. We interview two business leaders each and every week to provide actionable tips across marketing, sales, all to help you grow your business. And with that, we'll catch you on the next episode.